How many of you were taught by your mother growing up that it is that you should never discuss religion or politics in polite company? How many of you have heard that, been taught that somewhere along the way? All right, well, we're in big trouble today, unless you're not a polite company. Okay, no, I, I know everybody in here is polite company, and we're in trouble because we are going to continue to address the mess of human relationships with government. And I have to tell you this morning, God absolutely expects us to have healthy relationships with our government officials. And the title of the message today is the same thing as it was last week, because we're just concluding this message. It is Christian citizenship. And last week we talked about the complexity of that phrase. We are Christians and we are citizens. And if you are a believer, the Bible tells us that we are dual citizenships. We are dual citizens, not dual citizenships. We are dual citizens. And if you know anything about the Bible, our allegiance ultimately belongs with Christ and his kingdom, first and foremost. The Bible tells us that we are to view ourselves as strangers and pilgrims in this world. But I really love what Paul says and what he called us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He said that we are ambassadors for Christ. I love that thought. That's a big word right there. We are high-ranking diplomatic officials. Did you know that this morning? Did you know that that's who you are? Did you know that that's what your position is? We are high-ranking diplomatic uh, officials, and our job is to represent and promote Christ and his kingdom. That's why he has left us here in this world, and absolutely that means that we should affect our homes and our neighborhoods and our communities, and if you follow that all the way through, God wants us to be a light even to our community officials and our national politics and where he's put us. God wants us to have healthy relationships with government. Now, before I jump into the message, I could just jump right in here and we could pick up, but I want to ask you one more question this morning. How big is your God? How big is your God? The Bible says in Esther chapter 8, and I want you to go ahead and put these verses up here on the screen. I need you all to help me as we read through these, okay? Esther chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. I'm going to stop at certain spots, and then you're going to fill in the blanks, okay? Everybody good? You all with me? All right, so here's what it says in Esther chapter 8, verse 16. It said, the Jews had and, 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 and in every province... And in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had and a feast and a good day. How many of you want a feast and a good day today, man? That's an awesome phrase right there, but I really love how it ends. It says, you all read that last line with me, okay? It says, and many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Now, in its context, you have to understand how much of a miracle this is that we're talking about here. We're, you're talking about a complete reversal. This is the very day that the Jews should have been being wiped out throughout all of the Persian Empire because there was a law and a decree that was passed. On such and such a day, all of the people of the land could rise up and attack the Jewish people and murder them and kill them. But something absolutely incredible happened that completely reversed the, enti reversed the entire situation and a miracle came as a result. You know how God did that? He used his people. God, in his sovereignty, used his people. There's two men that are stars in the story. One is named Mordecai. Mordecai was a Jew who was devout in his relationship with the Lord. Haman was a ambitious, power-seeking, prideful man who was able to have an elevated position. He climbed up the ranks and Ahasuerus, the king, put him in charge of all of the princes and even gave a decree that people should bow to him. Well, guess who would not bow the knee to Haman? Mordecai. And when Haman found out that Mordecai wasn't bowing, he also found out that he was a Jew. And he found out that the Jews would not bow because they were believers in God and their ultimate allegiance was to him. And so he was not satisfied simply to have Haman eliminated. He was going to, I mean, Mordecai, he was going to have Mordecai and all of his people eliminated. So he skillfully got the king to pass this decree. Well, it just so happened right? Things just happen in life. Sometimes we think that, no, I believe that my God is sovereign. It just so happened that God allowed Mordecai to uncover a plot and save the king's life. It just so happened that one night the king didn't go to sleep. 
You know what's funny? I was just telling Lily in the back. I was just talking to Lily in the back right after the baptisms, and she was tired. And I said, Lily, you know what? Right now you're tired by choice because you can just stay up as long as you want and as late as you want. But when you get old, you're going to be tired just because you choose to go to sleep and you can't sleep at night. Anybody feel that with me this morning? The king couldn't sleep. So he did something very interesting. He had the history books brought to him. And as the, that'll put you to sleep right there. <laughs> and as the history books are being read, guess what happens? He realizes that a man named Mordecai had uncovered a plot that saved his life. And so he decided that he needed to honor him. So now Mordecai has a position of favor and esteem. It just so happens that Mordecai had a cousin and he had to adopt this cousin because she lost her parents. And it just so happened to be that her name was Esther. And it just so happened that Esther was very close to the king, as in his wife. God orchestrated all of these things. Mordecai comes to Esther and tells her about this plot, this, this law that had been passed, and how the Jews, her people, were in the very danger of her life. And he begs her, go to the king and see if you can do something to get him to stop it. And she's like, but if I do, I could die because I would be breaking the law of the land. I can't go to the king unless he calls me. And if he doesn't have favor on me, I'm done. And Mordecai says, who knows, Esther? Maybe you've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. You know what Esther did? Esther displayed a dependence on God. Esther had a fearless determination to face the great injustice of her day. How about the extermination of her people? How about anti-Semitism at work in history, alive and well at that time? How about she showed skill in navigating the unpredictable ego of her very powerful husband and the complicated politics of the land and all of that to say, and I could tell you so much else because that story is awesome. All of that to say that God used his people to save thousands and thousands of lives and to take a wrong situation and completely turn it upside down on its head. And can I say to you today that when we think about the political landscape, anybody here get discouraged? Anybody here turn on the news and you just want to bang your head against the wall and you feel like it's hopeless? And I'm not just talking about American politics. I'm talking about the world stage. Sometimes it feels hopeless. Sometimes it feels impossible. But can I tell you this morning, my God is on his throne and he is alive and well. And make no mistake about it, he is moving and working. And guess who he wants to use? He wants to use you and he wants to use me. How big is your God? When we get to passages of scripture like this, we better pay attention because make no mistake about it, God wants you to have a true impact on your land and your people for his honor and for his glory. So let's just jump right into it. Man, I gotta go through this fast. Honestly, this has been such a hard message. These past two weeks have been hard to prepare for because you don't come across passages like this often in the Bible. And then I wanna just talk about everything that there is to talk about. I mean, I understand that the things that I bring up are going to raise questions in your mind, and that's good. I think that there should be some soul searching and there should be some uh, interesting conversations that come as a result of this. I'm just gonna do the best that I can in the time that God's given me to present a few things that will hopefully... Line up with the truth of God's word and give us some truth that we can sink our teeth into and some practical applications that we can live by. So if it feels like you're drinking out of a fire hose, I'm going to do my best to just try to not do that. But we're going to go quick. All right. And we're going to cover as much of this as we can. So let's jump right in. Government requires subjection. Government requires subjection. Quick review. Last week in the first four verses, we saw that government is God's idea. The powers that be are ordained by God. He sets government up and he takes them down. Nothing happens without his hand of sovereignty, either allowing it or permitting it to take place. But then we also saw that government is intended for good. The reason why God establishes government, they have two main priorities. Promote good, punish evil. That's a pretty simple outline. Government's job and role is to promote good and to punish evil. How many of you agree that anarchy, mob rule, vigilante justice, that would be terrifying prospects? Anybody agree with that? I don't, we don't want to live in the Wild West, all right? I mean, we watch those good John Wayne movies, and it looks fun and interesting. I don't want to live out there. I'm glad that I can call 911, and I'm glad to know that I got people that are going to support me and protect me and help me to be able to live a quiet and peaceable life, okay? Government is intended for good. Now, we're going to pick up in verse 5. Look what it says. Wherefore, 
based on these two truths. Ye must needs be what? Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> Wherefore, ye must needs be not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. What he's saying here is government requires subjection. You need to be subject to the government that's over you, not just for fear of punishment, but for conscience sake. Because government is God's idea out of a reverence to God and respect to God and his order and his design and the way that he does things, we ought to be submissive and obedient to the government and to the authorities that God has placed in our life. Well, verse six takes it even a step further, all right? Look at what it says. Render, I mean, verse six. For, for this cause pay ye tribute also. Pay your taxes. Not only do we have to be subject, you have to pay your taxes. What are the only two things that are certain in life? Death and, and guess what? Even the Bible's not going to let you out of it. Don't go to the Bible and try to find a loophole for not paying your taxes because he says right here, pay your taxes. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, all right? Well, I love that the Bible doesn't just tell us to do things. It also gives us the reason why. Look at how that verse ends. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. All right, so those who serve the state, as legislators, civil servants, police officers, social workers, tax collectors, what does the Bible call them? Ministers of God. They are servants of God attending continually upon these things. What are those things? Promoting good and punishing evil. They are God's servants put in that position to attend continually upon our health and our well-being and our safety. Now, I know that I'm looking at a room that is filled with law-abiding citizens, especially traffic laws, right? So I'm just giving you a what if. There are people out there who speed and who break the law, and occasionally those lights get turned on behind them, and they get pulled over. The next time you get pulled over by a police officer, you know what you could do? You could shock them out of their mind. You could just say, hello, Reverend so-and-so. Thank you for doing your job at keeping me safe and enforcing the laws of the land. That's what the Bible said. They are God's ministers. Now, you don't actually have to call them uh, reverend, obviously, but understand this is God and his holy word. And what does he say? They are ministers of God. They are servants of God put in those positions to promote good and to punish evil. All right. So government requires subjection, but here's where I really want to go. Cause we talked a lot about this last week and there was a lot of great questions that came from this. This works both ways. Government requires subjection. This works both ways. Not just the subjection of its citizens, but the subjection of its leaders. Remember we talked about last week, the Bible is the guide, right? The Bible's the guide. How will government know what is good and what is evil? The truth of God's word, the foundation of truth. Guess what Romans 13 is? Romans 13 is the inspired word of God. God breathed this word to Paul. Paul penned it. This is God's message to us. And here's what you have to understand. God gave these words to Paul because he wanted Nero and all authorities to know what ought to be when it comes to government. Now, wouldn't it be awesome if government understood that their intended purpose was to promote good and to punish evil? And if all government officials understood that they are not ultimate, but that God is ultimate and that they need to be in subjection to him because he put them there and he can take them out just as easily. Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, guess what? Government does know this. On March 21st, 1933, Germany was in turmoil. It was less than two months after the Nazis seized power. Even those who voted for them felt uneasy about the drastic policies that were already being implemented. This was less than two months after the Nazis seized power. Well, on this day, March 21st, in this context, Protestant theologian Otto de Bellius stood before the newly elected parliament and he invoked Romans 13. They know the truth of God's word. This is only one example. There are all kinds of government examples that know and go to Romans chapter 13 to invoke obedience to those who are in authority over you. And you know what he told that, that newly elected par parliament and all of Germany? He told them that they had learned from Martin Luther that Christians may not fail to support the state, even not when the state acts hard and ruthlessly. Now, is that truly the case? Does God tell us to be in subjection to the government authorities that are over us? 
Yes, he does. But does that mean that we have to be no matter what? And the answer to that is no, not at all. Government answers to God. God is not ultimate. This is just as much written to government and government officials as it is to us. And they have a responsibility that they need to follow according to God's word. Here's how you can put it into play. How many of you understand that the Bible says, children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right? How many of you agree that that's a command from God? Well, are parents ultimate? If a mom or dad tells their children to do something that is direct violation to God's word, they don't need to obey that. We ought to obey God rather than man. And by the way, if parents abuse their authority and put their children in harmful situations, they're not ultimate. The government can step in and remove that child from their home if it's creating harm in their life. We all understand that. The Bible says that wives are to submit to their own husbands. It would be absolutely foolish to get up and preach that without talking to the husband and saying, you have a great responsibility. You're not ultimate. God's ultimate. And you're to love your wife the way that Christ loved the church. And how did he love it? He gave himself for it. You need to love your wife selflessly and sacrificially. It's not about you and your authority. It's about God and his authority. It's about having a home that operates and functions in the realms and in the bounds that God created it to. And if your husband tells you to do something that's in violation to God's word or puts you in harm's way, he's not ultimate. You can get out of that situation. Do you understand? The same thing goes when it comes to government. We're forbidden to overthrow the institution of government. Anarchy is not a good idea, but we are not required to blindly submit to every law and policy. So that lends to this question, and this is a big one, and we have to cover it because I even got some emails this week. But what about, but what about, when is civil disobedience okay? Now, finally, some of you are breathing free and you're like, it's about time (laughs) we have gotten here. Listen, you have to understand that as Americans, this is right up our alley. We are free, self-governing people, but how did our country begin? It began with a revolution. And every year on July 4th, we raise our fist back to King George and we remind him that you have no power over us. You know, we celebrate our independence and our revolution. To make matters even worse, guess where we live? We live in the South. The South is like, hey, I'm not going to have government tell me what to do. Even when it was something that was absolutely wrong and harmful, they didn't want nothing, the government telling them anything that they could do. And there was another revolt and another rebellion. But you know what? We are not the worst of the worst because you know who the worst of the worst is? Texans. (laughs) They're Americans, Southerners, and they were their own independent country. And they joined the United States of America with the whole idea, if we don't like it, we're out. And they still live that way even today. Am I right or am I wrong? How many Texans are in here this morning? I know you're going to stand up loud and proud. There, yes, exactly. So you understand what I'm talking about. Okay, seriously though, when is civil disobedience okay? Well, some Bible examples. You can go all the way back to Exodus. Pharaoh told the Hebrew midwives to kill all of the baby boys under two years of age. How many of you believe that that's something that you can disobey? How about you could fast forward and and we sung about Daniel and those three Hebrew boys this morning. Daniel was told that he couldn't pray. You know what Daniel did? He went to the window just like he did every single day of his life and he continued to bow his knee to his ultimate king and his ultimate authority, God himself, and it didn't matter what the laws of the land said. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow their knee to the idol of Nebuchadnezzar and they were thrown into the fire as a result of it. In the New Testament, you have Paul and the apostles who preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. What did Jesus Christ say? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. They weren't going to bow their knee. (laughs) They were going to continue to do what their king and their leader had commanded them to do, even in spite of what the laws of the land were. What about the United States of America? Anybody ever think of that question when it comes to this context? Was it right for a revolution? By the way, this was a big theological debate back then. Anybody ever heard of the Quakers? The Quakers were like, no, we're not going to war. This is wrong. I did some studying on that. There There was at least two theological Um, premises that they stood on. One was this, government is not to be opposed, but tyranny is. You know what tyranny in the wrong hands will do? Tyranny hurts and oppresses others. And I was thinking about this. Taxation without representation, those types of things, 
If there was no governor that was put on that, America could be another poor third world country because it was oppressed by unjust and unrightful leaders. So government's not to be opposed but tyranny is, and if it's doing something to hurt people. And another, another theological premise they lived by was God would not honor, honor an offensive war, but he did permit civil self-defense. And so um, the Minutemen at Lexington and Concord, you know what they were told? Don't fire unless fired upon. And so they weren't going to go and be the ones that provoked the war in that sense of raising up arms and going against it. But if they were fired upon, they were going to permit self-defense. Now, how, how many of you believe and understand that all of that could be really messy, how it plays out? <laughs> That's why we're talking about addressing the mess. But God, in his sovereignty and his goodness, he still moves and he still works. And all I want to say about this as practical application, train your conscience. Train your conscience. Before we start talking about civil disobedience, if that gets us fired up and excited about we want to rebel against the government and its authorities, something's off in a sense as Christians because God tells us to submit to the authorities that are in our life. And so we ought not to just jump right over that. Resistance ought to be a last resort. Resistance ought to be something that's in direct violation to God and his word. Man, resistance ought to be built deeply on biblical principles. I mean, do you love God enough that if the law of the land came down, that if you don't bow your knee to Nebuchadnezzar, you're gonna be thrown into the fire? How many of you are just gonna bow your knee to save your life? Or how many of you are gonna say, no, my king and my God is Jesus and I'm not gonna bow because I serve a different master. Hey, all I'm saying is we better make sure that we have a right walk and a right relationship with God. And even when it comes to matters of disobedience or areas where we step up, man, we ought to do it. Where we can walk away with our testimony intact and faith in Christ clearly seen. That's the point. Should never be something that's done frivolously or lightly. Okay, so government requires subjection. Government answers to God. Train your conscience. And last but not least, we're jumping to this last point. Government requires participation. Look at verse 7. Government requires participation. Look at verse 7. It says this. Render, therefore, to all their dues. Everybody help me out. Okay, here we go. Tribute to whom tribute is due. We'll read the whole verse out loud together. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. You know what this verse is saying? Pay your taxes. Pay your bills, respect your leaders, and give honor to the people that God has placed in authority over you. In other words, actively participate. Actively participate. Government requires participation. Citizenship is stewardship. Citizenship is stewardship. To whom much is given, much is required. All right, so... I already mentioned the verse that Jesus himself said, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. In the American context, who is Caesar? We, the people of the United States of America. In, in our context, we are Caesar. We are a self-governing, constitutional, representative republic. I'm not gonna break that down for you today. You can go back to civics class in high school. You can go look at that up online to look at all the ins and outs. I don't have time to break that down. All I'm trying to say is this. The American Caesar requires more of us than just general civic obedience and respect. It requires our active participation. The whole rest of this is just three practical applications that we can walk away from, okay? Just some simple things. I wish I had time to break these down wholly, but let's just jump into it. Here's number one, okay? Practical application from Romans chapter 13. Wake up. Wake up. We can't avoid politics and public life entirely to focus on the gospel. We are people of extremes. How many of you agree that? We, are people, we tend to go from one end of the spectrum to the other. We can either go to, like, we become so focused on politics and Christians and government that, like, that becomes primary. Or we can swing the other end and say, no, our primary job is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of you would agree that probably somewhere in the middle is the best place to be? Obviously, we are ambassadors for Christ, and we lead to lift high the name of Jesus. But obviously, we live in a world that we get to influence and that we get to affect. Both things are extremely important. We can't just avoid it. Everything is political. Everything is political. How many of you had breakfast this morning before you left your house? 
Do you understand that if you bought those groceries at the store that they were all approved by the FDA before they ever got into there? Political, right? How many of you drove a car to church today? No one took the subway. Okay, yeah, we don't have that around here. You drove a car to church today. That was inspected by government officials to make sure it meets the standards. Political. You drove on roads that have speed limits. Political. If you broke, did anybody get pulled over on their way to church this morning? Come on, confession is good for the soul. <laughs> Praise God. Every, oh my goodness, I saw a hand. I won't call you out, Gloria. Oh, my bad. Just kidding. <laughs> Wow. All right. So anyway, political. Guess what? Tomorrow is Monday. How many of you kids have to go to school tomorrow on Monday? Just everybody in here. It's that time of year. I don't think anybody's off tomorrow. Guess what? If you don't send your kids to school and you can't prove that you're actually homeschooling them and giving them an education, guess who's going to show up at your house? Truancy officers. How many of you are going to work tomorrow on Monday? Guess what's going to be taken out of your paycheck on Friday? Taxes. All I'm trying to say is if you stop and think about it, every single area of our life is affected by politics. It's political. Here's what we have to know. Every decision that is made in public life, whether we're talking about our day-to-day life, foreign policy, immigration, employment law, Every single thing has a moral component. They try to act like you can't legislate morality. All of legislation is morality. It's all supposed to be, whether they go back to the Bible or not, whatever laws we come up with are some sort of determination of what is good and what is evil. So everything has a moral component. Here's the reality. We will not survive as a society. I'm talking about the United States of America. I'm talking about every country in the world. We will not survive as a society if religious principles are viewed as dangerous and if secular philosophies are handed a monopoly on meaning. If religious principles are viewed as dangerous. Do you understand that the biblical view of marriage is viewed as dangerous? Do you have the... Do you understand that the biblical view of life and conception and that every person is created in the image and likeness of God and is fearfully and wonderfully made is viewed as dangerous? Secular philosophies like my body, my choice. I agree with that in many ways. I agree with that in many ways all the way up to the point where another life and another soul is inside of your body. And we base that not off of cruelness, or the fact that we're not trying to be loving or understanding, but because of the truth of God's word, that is a life. That is a soul. That is a never to die person. Our responsibility and obligation is to protect those who can't protect themselves. We're to be concerned with justice and equality. And it's our responsibility to be the conscience of the state and to step up for that. I'm thankful for our church that we've been able to go to the abortion clinic at Pensacola and just stand outside of that. Not, not me, just praying. That's fulfilling our duty as the conscience of the state. When people show up, they have to know there's something different about what I'm doing. Something different about what's to be done. I'm thankful for the, the March for Life that we participate in. Again, just a reminder. It's a peaceful protest, but a reminder that there is something about life. And abortion is wrong. I could talk about love is love. The Bible defines marriage just like government is an institution of God. Guess what else is an institution of God? The family. And if the family breaks down, society breaks down. And by the way, our world understands that. Government understands that the family is a mess and the family is broken. And they're trying to do so many things to restore the family except for ignoring what God says the family should be. I don't stand on this position because I'm hateful and I'm mean. I stand on it because God says that that's what his position is. It's what the truth of God's word is. Marriage is between a man and a wife, one man and one woman for a lifetime. And by the way, you can go study that out. And you will see how effective God's plan is and the difference that it makes in children and in societies. Now, here's a practical point from this. We have to be so careful not to allow the secular world and the secular media to hijack our positions on this. And by the way, Christians have done a whole lot of harm in this. 
we come across as being more hateful than we do loving. You know what the Bible says in Matthew 5, 16? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I could go all kinds of ways with this, but let me beg of you and implore of you. I don't know what all we can do nationally to affect the political landscape on this issues, but I know what we can do to our family members. I know what we can do to our neighbors. I know what we can do to the people in this community, and we can love them, and we can view them as they are, people that are created in the image and likeness of God that need the love of Jesus. And man, people ought to be so thoroughly confused by what the national media tells them Christians are when they see our love and good works in action. And you know what? We, we all can understand this. Parents sometimes have wayward children, right? And they don't love what their children are doing, but do they passionately love their children? That's exactly how we should view this world around us. Not just in the LGBTQ community, but on people with addiction, people that are struggling, people need Jesus. And our job is to love people to Jesus and our good works ought to be shouting and screaming loud and clear, as loud and clear as our positions are shouting. It needs to be both. we got to wake up. I mean, we got to build bridges and mend fences. It's another thing. Build bridges and mend fences. We just talked about the family is broken. By the way, if the family is broken and the church is weak, that's another institution that God's created, the church. Who's left to try to solve all of the problems? Government. If the family's not doing what it's supposed to do, if the church isn't doing what it's supposed to do, it leaves a great big giant void and the government steps into it. And we can complain about big government or we can engage with both political parties to try to swing them back towards biblical principles. We live in a conservative area. My mom and dad live in New Jersey. They live in a liberal area. Guess what? It doesn't matter where your church is, whoever your government officials and leaders are, you need to try to do everything you can to work with them, to point them back towards Christ and biblical solutions. The government and church should be partners, not opponents. And by the way, there are all kinds of opportunities for the church and state to work together. You know, one of the biggest areas of need that the government recognizes and they are desperate for help, it's in addiction recovery. Man, we heard a testimony this morning from CCR. Will you praise God for the people in our church that loves the addicted community enough to show them the love of Jesus? Yes. I'm thankful for a ministry like that. And you know what? They're, they're begging for churches. <laughs> We, we have a good relationship with the probation office, and when they need some classes afterward, they refer them to West Florida Baptist Church and to the recovery program. These are ways that we can work together. And guess what the church has to offer that government doesn't have to offer? Hope. Real hope. There's power in the name of Jesus. And you haven't found any way to break this addiction, but I'll tell you somebody who can help you, and his name is Jesus. The church can offer hope. The church can offer community a place where they're loved and they're accepted and people are sitting there helping them get back on their feet and helping them get back to where they ultimately want to be in life. Man, addiction affects so many people. And by the way, if you struggle with addiction, we love you. By the way, if you struggle with homosexuality, we love you. We love people. We want to help you. We want to point you to Jesus. We want to do everything we can. That's what the church should do. How about foster care? You know, the, the, the stats on foster care are absolutely mind-boggling when you look at them until you break them down. I think I, I read in a book, there's around 430,000 kids in foster care across America. Guess how many churches there are in America? 430,000, around that same number. Why in the world is there still such a huge problem in the foster care community? If the people of God would follow pure religion, which is to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction... That's what God says is pure. You, you know what's awesome is the care portal. I, we, we sometimes use the care portal here. The care portal was actually is run and monitored by child professional workers, professional children's workers, okay? Ministers of the state. And you know what they're doing? They're begging for churches and community members to help them meet needs so that way they can help children stay with their mom and dad because that's the best place for them to be. And sometimes just because of financial situations or simple things, they're not able to do that and the church can step in and meet the need and fill the gap. All I'm trying to say, these are practical areas in our own community where we can make a real true difference if we're focused on building bridges and mending fences and we're not always just like everything is bad. 
government's bad. There's things that need to be worked on. Build bridges, mend fences. We have a chance to make a real difference. And last is this. Consider public service. Consider public service. Consider a life of public service. Those who serve the state as legislators, civil servants, police officers, social workers, tax collectors, they are ministers of God. Wouldn't it be awesome if more and more Christians stepped into that role? Not that that was their primary focus. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, right? We are ambassadors for Christ. So our primary goal and objective is to lift high the name of Jesus. And what if we went into our local police forces? And what if we went into local politics? And what if we served the state or served the federal government in these types of ways with the idea of I'm on the inside and I can use my influence to point people to Jesus? I'm thankful that we have people like that in our church. We got multiple people that are having a real, genuine impact in their community through their jobs and their careers. And they're gospel-centered, wanting to lift high the name of Jesus. Consider public service. Consider knowing your public servants. We need to vote. We need to vote. Voting's important. We get to actively participate in our government. By the way, I saw this, and it's so good, and I'm going to leave it alone. I cannot break this down. I don't have time. But unless Jesus is on the ballot, we will always be voting for the lesser of two evils. So if you want some advice when it comes to voting, I'll just say this. We have a two-party system in the United States. If you really want to have a chance to have influence, the two parties are probably the best way to do that. You're always voting for the lesser of two evils. Which party, which platform, I don't know, which one lines up more closely with the truth of God's word? Train your conscience. But we got to vote. We have a responsibility there. But here's really where I want you to go with this. Did you know that our government was designed where the president of the United States really would not have that much power? Where the federal government would actually be limited in its scope and in its power? Did you know that our Constitution was designed where your county commissioners and your local sheriff have more of an effect on your everyday life than the federal government does? So here's the case. How many of you even know the name of our sheriff? How many of you know the name of our county commissioners? How many of you are involved in local politics? Wouldn't it behoove us as good citizens and members of our community that are going to honor the government and the authority that God's placed in our lives to get to know? To maybe show up to a few things when it's time to vote and try to have a good understanding of who these people are and what they stand for? I'm not saying you change your whole life around, but we have a responsibility and we have a duty. Consider Knowing your public servants. And then last, consider public servants in prayer. And this is where we're going to close. First Timothy 2, 1 through 2. Can you put it up on the screen? Look what Paul says to Timothy here. He says this to the church, to all of us. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And then verse 2. For kings... And for all that are in authority, everybody finish that verse with me. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. When was the last time you got on your knees and fervently, genuinely prayed for the authorities that are in your life? If I'm being honest, I don't do it often enough on a regular basis. You know what the Bible says? I exhort you, I beg you, I plead with you, pray for all men, for kings, And for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. You know what we've been able to do here in the United States of America for hundreds of years now? Live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. You know what our end goal is? Our end goal is to be able to get up every day and to be able to lift high the name of Jesus, to be able to share the gospel with others, to be able to come to church, to be able to be good neighbors, to be able to be good citizens in our community, to just live a quiet and peaceable life where we can live out our faith. And you know what the Bible says to do? We have to pray about it. And we have a God in heaven who's big enough. And the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And he turns it whithersoever he wills. How big is your God? Is he big enough that we can take his word seriously at face value and we can understand the responsibility that's given to all of us to truly impact this world for Christ and to make a difference?